What are the greys? These strange creatures that have been appearing to thousands and thousands of people for many years now. What are they really? Could it be that they are artificial creations of their masters, robots that are seeking human souls? Stay tuned to the Midnight Ride and we're going to find out. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up. Good evening, everybody, and welcome once again to the Midnight Ride. It is my pleasure once again to welcome all of you into the Puritan Barn to the Now You See TV studios for the Midnight Ride with myself and John Pounders. Tonight, we are going to be pushing the envelope, as is our custom on the Midnight Ride, and we're going to be talking about alien soul snatchers. Is it possible? that this could be a reality, that there are fallen entities that are out to rip the souls from human beings. Stick around and find out, and you won't have long to wait because it all starts right now because we're now live, live, live. What's up, guys? It's good to be here once again in the Puritan Barn to do this with you guys. What a blessing it is for us all to be here. This topic is is sure to turn some heads let's put it that way i know that you know this this kind of stuff that we're seeing in the world is just unprecedented things that we've been told that don't exist things that we've been told um that are not part of our world are actually starting to spring forth and so we're excited to talk about that tonight let us know where you guys are from in the chat or in the comments if you're watching this later we will be right back after a word well maybe after a word from our sponsors here we go guys mainstream companies put dangerous chemicals in their products that contribute to disease and disability. This is why it's so important that we take care in the products that we consume. The skin is the largest organ in your body and it is the covering to your temple. Our sponsor tonight is Sugar and Spice Soap Company. They create all natural and biblically clean soaps and beauty products. They even have a soap for Midnight Ride listeners. Use coupon code NYSTV to receive 10% off all your purchases. Link in the description. If this is true, then our country is in a lot of trouble. We would have these trips, these special trips. But he said, my, my daddy takes the bodies to the grocery store and he grinds them up and puts it in the hamburger. And nobody ever knows it. How can kids, six, eight, ten years old, be describing rituals that come from a book like the, like the Book of the Dead? It's hard to get your mind around people being capable of this kind of evil. All right, guys, we are back. Thank you so much for waiting. And I promise you that this is going to be worth your while. We hope so. Anyway, we do our best to make sure that if every minute that you watch, you're not wasting. So if you're interested in any of those things, uh, check them out below. I know David has a couple shows coming up on his network. You can check out FOJCRadio.com and check out their list of shows over there. Also, we have nystv.org where you can check out the stuff we have going on over there. Uh, I just want to give you guys a heads up. Tomorrow, there was a flat earth debate between Greg Locke 
and Dean Odell. So tomorrow here on this network, uh, sometime early evening before David's show, uh, I'm going to be doing a watch party of the Flat Earth debate if you guys want to watch it with me, and I'm going to comment and stuff like that. So it should be good, hopefully, if that video is still up by then, if uh, if it's somebody didn't get spanked too bad and want to remove it. I have no idea. But with that being said, David, what, else, what do you got going on tomorrow? Tomorrow night at 8 p.m. is going to be the debut of our Cities Lost in Time series. I am very excited about it. Uh, we got a lot of work done on it. And if you want to go to the FOJC Radio Underground Church YouTube channel, you can watch the trailer. The trailer is just absolutely top-notch. It looks like something from the History Channel or better than that. Brian has just done a great job with it. So we're really looking forward to that. Uh, Cities Lost in Time, 8 p.m. Central Time tomorrow night on FOJC Radio Underground Church. Fantastic. And one one more thing, too, while I'm, while I'm on these terms of thinking uh, most of you guys know that the holidays are coming up and there's a lot of divided households on whether to celebrate uh, certain holidays and uh, me and my wife actually have a patreon channel which is 100 percent free by the way we don't ask anybody to donate to it but if you want to feel free but if you go check it out it's free and me and my wife are actually going to be doing a live broadcast there on monday talking about our struggles in marriage that we had uh, previously with these things. So if you want to check that out, please do. Links are in the description. And that's all I got, David. And now I think you guys are probably tired of hearing all this stuff, so we're going to get on the show. You ready, David? Let's ride. Let's do it. Let's ride. And what we have here is a drawing by Aleister Crowley of an entity he claimed he encountered in 1917. He was doing magical workings called the Amla, the Amla, the Amalantra, Amalantra workings. And he claimed he met this entity that came through a portal called Lamb. And since this time, there have been thousands and thousands and thousands of people that have described seeing entities like this. And that's what we're going to explore tonight. We're going to ask the question, what are they really? And what are they really doing? And could they have a much more nefarious agenda than what we have even suspected thus far. Now, when Lamb came through the portal, Mr. Crowley also came into contact with an entity called Iwas. Uh, you could call him Iwash if you want, but Iwas dictated to Aleister Crowley, the book of the law, do what thou will, which was the basis of his Abbey of Thelema, and he proclaimed the Aeon of Horus. And Horus is the, the age of Horus is the age of the child. Isis and Horus are pictured as the mother and child, uh, much like um, Mary, the, the Blessed Virgin Mary of Catholicism is pictured with the Eucharistic Jesus. And in the slide of Horus, here's a couple depictions of Horus. And Horus in the Egyptian uh, mysteries was had the falcon head. Now, these are heroes, David. I thought on your slide you wanted heroes, but I apologize. I can pull those uh, other pictures, the Egyptian pictures as well. But I think what everybody's seen is the ones with the the nose going out for, like that. I, I apologize. I put, <laughs> I put superheroes on here uh, that are falcons as well. And uh, okay, well, my apologies. We but hey, I think that they uh, derive from something that you're talking about. Well, they sure do. And this <laughs> uh, and, you know, we we have the uh, horse was depicted as half human, half bird, you know, with the falcon head. And that's pretty much what we have here in these two superheroes and the idea of uh, that these super heroes uh, that you know they go back to the Nephilim which is exactly what we're talking about the the heroes of old the men of renown and that's exactly what it is so Crowley encountered uh, these entities from beyond and since that time these greys have been appearing to a lot of people now this is a book called Flying Saucers Are Hostile. And to my knowledge, this is the first book that ever talked about alien greys. And in this book, which was came out in 1967 by Brad Steiger and Joan Rittenauer, it talks about the encounter that a man had in, uh, in New York, I believe. This is, uh, he, he was a longshoreman 
and in 1965 in Brooksville, Florida. He described this encounter, and I'll just read a little bit about what Mr. Reeves said. He said, um, I went way around the side of the hill. I came undetected right up to the bushes, but the saucer was on the other side of the bushes, so I crawled into the bushes, and I was less than a hundred feet from it. So I stooped down like I was watching it. All of a sudden, over to the left of me, I happened to see this robot. He was about 200 feet away, and he came over, and he walked to the spaceship, turned around, and he walked up a little bit where I was. And he goes on later, and, and he describes this. Uh, he said uh, this robot, he said, was about five feet tall. He wore a gray silver suit like some kind of a, uh, a canvas suit. And the early descriptions that people give of these grays are very much like they really, and they actually called them robots. So, you know, I think maybe we could at least entertain the theory that maybe they are robots. And with many people that have encountered these grays, they'll do all kinds of nasty, invasive things to people, and they're emotionless, like they're just, uh, they have no emotion, and uh, they're just uh, total empaths. Now, this is a book, everybody that's got a library, you got to have you one of these in your library, the Extraterrestrial Species Almanac, uh -huh. you know. And uh, this is an interesting work, it really is, that just goes over. And, and there have literally been so many different kinds of these entities that have appeared to people over so many years that they can be studied and classified. Mm -hmm. And I'll just read a little bit what this book says about the grays. And it says short grays are responsible for the alien abductions against humanity to upgrade the race. Biologically covered metal-like implants are inserted into the abductees' bodies. Those under their bioengineering program, they kidnap humans, use mind control to keep them sedated, extract sperm and ova, use female wombs mixed with their genetics as incubators, remove the fetus between two and three months, continue to grow it in their labs, and then repeat the process. They have no remorse for their actions or empathy for their victims. And the more you read of the different accounts of the grays and how they work and how they operate, they sound very robotic, just like they are... Um, uh, a, a robot that is controlled by their creator. And this is also, I know, in the recent UFO testimony before Congress. That is the way one of the pilots that saw a UFO it said it looked like a robotic drone that was being controlled from somewhere else. But this is what we're going to do, and that we're going to explore this theory tonight. And this theory is not one that I have come up with. This is a theory that has been uh, put out there and discussed. One of the fellows that uh, was one of the originators of this theory, Nigel Kerner, and we're going to be talking about his book this evening on gray aliens and artificial intelligence. And that is indeed the theory of Mr. Kerner and others that these grays are soul thieves. They're here to steal the souls of humans because they don't have one. You know, and it's interesting too because these there's a lot, you know, we're going to talk, you're probably going to talk a little bit about this, but there's so many different soul packs going on and so many different things going on in the world right now, indicating that people are literally selling their souls too. You were talking about in the book, how women are reporting, and this is a, a worldwide phenomenon, by the way, women are reporting that they are pregnant and then all of a sudden, boom, no signs of pregnancy whatsoever. No, no reason for the fetus to be removed or anything just no sign of pregnancy whatsoever and this is we're talking upwards and if i remember right david upwards of over a hundred thousand people in the last five years um have reported this and i could be wrong on those stats it could have been 10 years but either way that's a lot of people and if anything those stats are probably low i mean we're talking hundreds of thousands of people yeah. and into the millions that have reported these greats i yeah. mean it's uh it is um and it's a truly a worldwide uh phenomenon yeah. and you know several years ago we had a we did a broadcast with timothy alberino and we were discussing several years ago the possibility 
of a devil possessed machine. We had the discussion, could it be possible with the tremendous advances they're making in AI for actually a machine to be possessed by a spirit? Wow. And I believe that it is. Yes, I believe that it is. And that's another aspect of this that is uh, very chilling. But I, I think it's one that we need to be aware of. And we have to begin to realize what the implications are. And the bottom line is Satan wants to steal your soul. I mean, he just doesn't want to make you misbehave. He wants to rip your soul out of your body and doom you forever as an eternal reprobate. You know, nothing less than that is his game plan. Now, is there anything in Scripture that would give us reason to believe that this might be a possibility? And indeed there is. Let's go to the book of Ezekiel, and let's begin in chapter 3. Uh-oh, we need 13 here, John. I'm oh, sorry. Really? You want me to pull it up and read it? Ezekiel 3? Yeah, uh, Ezekiel 13. 13. Ezekiel 13, 19 through 21. 19 through 21. I was wondering when I put that up there what that had to do yeah, with what we were talking I didn't, about. I'm sorry I didn't catch that on the run through. The... Uh, that's all right. I will read it real quick if you'd like me to. Yes, go ahead. Okay, so you got it pulled up here. It says, And ye pollute me among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread to slay the souls that shall not die and to save the souls alive that should not live, or um, should not die, not shall not die. But you're lying to my people that hear your lies. And that's a question. Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I'm against your pillows. Wherefore, ye there hunt the souls to make them fly, and I will tear them from your arms and will let their souls go, even the souls that ye hunt to make them fly. Your kerchiefs also will I tear and deliver my people out of your hand, and they shall be no more in your hand to be hunted, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Now that is quite a profound scripture, and yeah. that is talking about nothing less than people that are stealing the souls of humans through black magic rituals. I'll re and it even sounds like uh, uh, in one part that they might even be restrained on a bed. It says, I will tear uh, your kerchiefs from them. Now let's get a little insight from Daniel Block's commentary in the book of Ezekiel, and let's take a little deeper look into here what we got going on. And Mr. Block wrote, it says, some form of magical power is involved here. It seems best to associate the singular form of the noun cassette with the Akkadian verb kesu to bind and the noun kastiu binding magic referring to magical bands worn on the wrists and arms. It is also easily associated with magical appurtenances, specifically amulets tied to a string and worn like a phylactery on the forehead or more likely brought over the head and worn around the neck. Whatever the nature of the kesatot and their misafat, they appear to have been instruments of black magic. And it says, uh, Mr. Blanc says, the ambition of these women was matched by their energy. They pursued their victims, the unsuspecting, like hunters and the prey. The aim of a witch hunting for souls would be to gain control over these demons and thereby exercise power over the human person. This is something that is old. It, is, uh, it has been going on for so long. And the understanding of the dark realm and their belief in the ability to actually remove someone's soul, this is something they very much believe. It's something they very much believe and very much practice. And not only do they aim at controlling the individual, but by sometimes absolutely reducing themselves to what we will be discussing would be a zombie state or that which we could call a walk-in. Now, this is a theme that has been developed in predictive program for years and years and years. 
And this is just one of many movies. This movie is an old movie, The Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And I think probably almost everybody's seen this movie. It's an old classic sci-fi. And that's it. You know, aliens come in and they take over the bodies of humans. And this has been in so many movies that uh, it, it is just off the chart, this concept and this idea of people being taken over by alien forces. Now, this goes way, way back. We saw it here in the Word of God that was relating it. We're going to get into more scripture that definitively ties it to the Egyptian mystery religions and to, the, to really see what these women were up to, to get a little better, uh, better glimpse at just exactly the spiritual dynamic that is in place. Now, what we have here is a picture that is called the ritual in the king's chamber. And you see here the, uh, the person in the ritual, and I'll just read a little bit of text here to help us understand what's going on. This is from Manley P. Hall's book. It's entitled The Phoenix, and this was one of the rituals in the Egyptian mysteries. And on page 172, Mr. Hall writes this, The king's chamber was the scene of the great climax of the initiatory drama. Here, crucified upon a St. Andrew's cross, the candidate was suspended like the solar god upon the cro his cross of the equinoxes and the solstices. After the solar crucifixion had been performed, the candidate was laid in the great stone coffin for three days, his spirit freed from its mortal coil. We're talking about a three-day out-of-the-body experience. Mm -hmm. There are many people that teach and talk about the OBEs, and they say, well, this is a good thing. Well, let me tell you what. I believe that OBEs are real, but they're really dangerous for people that want to engage in occult practices and go out of their body. And a lot of the, a lot of people, even the government, they have uh, programs where they have people that remote view and do various things like this. Uh, you know, this is a very, very dangerous thing. And could you imagine going out of your body for three days? You know, and my question would be, what would come back? Would it be the soul of the individual? And this is what's depicted. I'll read a little more text. It says, wandered at the gateways of eternity, his ka as a bird flew through the spiritual spheres of space. And this is the way the Egyptians pictured the soul as a ka, which was a half bird, half human. And you remember the god Horus, the Aeon of Horus that was proclaimed by Crowley. Horus was pictured as a human with the falcon head. So here we have this same uh, thing depicted. Now what I'm thinking is this might not be what come out, but this might be what goes back in. Mm. You know, after three days out of your body, uh, you know, watch out. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting. You know, it reminds me of the Freemason, the first degree, when you enter the first degree, how you basically, I, I, well, I actually, I don't know if it's the first degree, you know more, but one of the secret societies where you lay in a coffin and uh, basically who knows what else you're doing in there, but it reminds me of that. And these symbols are obviously, you know, occult symbols that look like Freemason symbols, but when it talked about in Ezekiel 13, the kerchiefs, like the veil, and it talks about the magic bands or the or the pillows. You know, the word pillows could mean magic bands. It's used other in other verses as magic bands. Yeah. It reminds me of the, the apron and yeah. and also the cuffs that they wear. So it's interesting. I don't know if it has anything to do with it, but it does remind me of that in a, in a big way. Yeah. And that word in the Hebrew that Mr. Block was talking about, like a kerchief, I will tear my kerchief from you. This could very well mean like a kerchief or an apron. Yep. And we're looking at a ritual that a in Ezekiel 13 that a man entered into with a woman on a bed. And uh, we're going to see in the book of Proverbs that there certainly could be some sexual enticement there, but there was much more involved there than just sexual sin. It was a very distinct and prolific ritual for a very, very distinct purpose, nothing less than uh, taking over the soul. And, and just one final word of caution. Uh, there is uh, 
like I say, there's many new age practitioners that want to uh, talk about the OBEs as something good, something fun, something cool. It is not. It is not something you want to do. It is dangerous. We want to, the, the Bible says, the, Paul prayed in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, that he, we would be sanctified body, soul, and spirit. We want to be whole, not separated. And another thing, too, that I wanted to, I just wanted to say real quick, too, we're talking about out-of-body experiences. I, I really, based on an experience I have myself, I truly believe that you need to pray before you go to bed because I had an experience when I first became a believer where I had, uh, and, and I, this makes me sound crazy when I say it, but it's true, and it happened to me. And uh, But I, I was, if I wouldn't have known better, I would have think that I was trying to be abducted by aliens, you know. But I, in, in, in that moment, I understood that it was a spiritual thing, but um, th whatever it was tried to make my soul leave my body. I mean, it almost, it left my body and slammed back into me. And this is like, this is real, this has really happened to me. It was crazy. Lights were flashing, entities trying to take me. All of these different things happened to me. And, of course, people can chalk it up as uh, you're crazy or you're imagining things, whatever. And all of that could be true. But ultimately, um, I, I've, I've been wanting to warn people of this. You need to pray, especially with stuff like this going down. If they if they can actually do this to people without them being aware, which I believe it's very possible, and I don't know what you think about that, David, yeah. then we need to be definitely praying over ourselves, over our children, over um, you know anybody that could be possibly underneath the spells or the um, magic of a witch or a warlock of some sort. The amount of people that have experienced what we would call sleep paralysis and some kind, it's called the old hag syndrome, because many people describe someone sitting on their chest, and sometimes they literally can see like an old, grotesque woman sitting on their chest. That's why it's called the old hag syndrome. And this is uh, so many people. We're talking, I mean, hundreds of thousands of people that have uh, experienced sleep paralysis. And uh, the, the this is also tied in with even more nefarious things, the incubi and the succubi. There's the... Um, the the Lilith, uh, who the the devil, and I believe Lilith is a female Nephilim spirit, and for many 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 thousands of years, there have been people that have feared Lilith that she would come in the middle of night to uh, destroy the the unborn ch child in the mother's womb. So these attacks at the night are very real. And uh, like, you know, p p saying your prayers before you go to bed. Yes, that's a good thing. That's a real good thing. And our our bodies, we are a body, we're a soul and a spirit. And our body is there to protect the soul. Our soul is immaterial. It, it has substance to it, but it is very ephemeral uh, compared with the body. And when our soul leaves our body, it's a punching bag for spirits in the spiritual realm. You don't want to do that. You can literally um, get your soul destroyed doing that. It's nothing to play with. It is nothing to play with at all. And, and I've even heard stories of witches claiming to be able to astral project and do spiritual battle with people while they're sleeping. Yes. Um, and that's that's interesting to me as well. Yes. And this is a this is another advanced witches. Uh, they absolutely will astral project into a person's room. You're absolutely right, John. And um, uh, I'll do a little prayer for <laughs> on them uh, to have them taken care of while they're out flying around because uh, they're very vulnerable also. They don't realize that, but they are placed themselves in a very, very vulnerable state, very dangerous, yeah. needless to say. Um now let's go back into the scripture and let's dig down a little deeper to help us understand. We saw the picture in the book of Ezekiel of the black magic ritual of literally making the souls to fly. And it says, well, you, you want to save some souls alive. You want to destroy some. I mean, these people were using black magic to manipulate and control souls. It's just amazing. But in Proverbs 7 and 10, and behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. 
Now, this woman was obviously using uh, sexual enticement, but the thing that she was enticing men into was more than just sexual sin. Beginning in verse 13, it says, So she caught him and kissed him, and with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. Now notice this woman is a good, obedient, religious person. She'd been doing her offerings, you know. So she's coming to this guy as uh, supposedly an obedient, someone obedient in the uh, Israeli religious system, which she obviously wasn't. There, I Therefore came I forth to meet thee diligently to seek thy face, and I have found thee. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved work, with fine linen of Egypt. Now, here we have a connection of what this woman's doing with the bed, just like we saw in Ezekiel, the 13th chapter. And here it is also connected with the Egyptians and with the, the many gods and the carvings of Egypt. In the 8th chapter of Ezekiel, it talks about the hole opening up in the wall, and they saw all the animals of Egypt that they worshiped there. So we've got a, something profound going on here. And in verse 17, I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. Now, as we read on, we learn more. In uh, the, what the Bible says about this woman and her bed and all of her perfume, in verse 727, it, and this is talking about the strange woman. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. Now, when the, and this is literally in hell, in the Hebrew, the word is shoal, and literally the person that gets into bed with this strange woman, the soul goes into the underworld. We have more than just a sexual right here. We have literally someone opening up where their soul, and we're not talking about uh, pie in the sky by and by. We're talking about the literally entering of the soul from the bed of the woman into the underworld. And Proverbs 21, 16 speaks to this also. The man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. The congregation of the dead, literally, we're talking about the congregation of the Rephaim, which is in Shoal. And this is what the text is saying for the man that is going to jump in bed with the little strange woman with the Egyptian bedsheets, that literally your soul can wind up leaving your body and being in the congregation of the dead. Now, we'll look at a Bible commentary on Proverbs chapter 21, verse 16. This is Whedon's Bible commentary, and this is what it says in the commentary. In the congregation or assembly of the Rephaim, and literally the congregation of the dead, uh, that word dead is Rephaim. We're talking a little Nephilim church here in the heart of the underworld. Go, Mr. Whedon says, in the congregation or assembly of the Rephaim, go shades whose dwelling place is Shoal, the underworld or infernal regions. The righteous expect to be delivered out of Shoal, but of these wanderers, the proverb says that they shall remain and abide there. So there's something very, very dangerous here. The deliberate attempt of people that are in the know on the dark side to literally take the soul now and here again let let's just think about this why would they want to do that why would these Rephaim in the heart of the earth want the soul of a human well let's think about it what are devils the devils in the new testament according to the book of enoch they are when when a fallen angel mated with the human woman it created what the Bible calls a Nephilim and a Rephaim. And when that entity died, according to the book of Enoch, the soul did not resurrect. It, it just was a disembodied spirit. And the disembodied spirit of the dead Nephilim and Rephaim, this is what we see in the New Testament as the devils. So if they don't have a soul, maybe they want one. 
you know, maybe these all the way back before Christ, that these rituals were for the purpose of stealing the soul of a human being, that these creatures in the heart of the earth that have no soul might be able to function in our realm in some kind of a form or fashion. Now, I want to read a, a couple things here from this book from Nigel Kerner. I believe Mr. Kerner has passed away, but he wrote a couple very fascinating books uh, on this subject, and he was one of the uh, main thinkers on this that would uh, put this out there, and I think there's something to it. But on page 21, uh, Mr. Kerner wrote this, From all accounts, the greys are more like machines, biological robots that may have been programmed in such a way as to preserve the identity of their creators for eternity. And the things that are being done now uh, with Elon Musk, we now have, uh, we were talking last week on the ride about the brain phone and uh, Mr. Musk, Neuralink, where literally human beings are becoming part machine. And people are going to beg for uh, these machine parts, the brain phones, and all of these upgrades to be put into them. And in the same way, human beings are becoming more like machines, and machines are becoming more human. To where actually, just like Mr. Kerner put forth here, that there could be these machines that literally have the DNA of the creators in them. More or less, they're trying to, to make themselves immortal, you know, and this is, a, this is something that has also been explored by Hollywood in the Johnny Depp movie, Transcendence, and this is an idea that's been out there, and maybe this is what they're really done. Yeah, it could occur where it would very well be next week. That's kind of you know, what I'm going to be discussing is has a lot to do with Hollywood and uh, a possible ritual that they are using in order to give them immortality and um, not only immortality, but unlimited funds. And so uh, that's what I'll be talking about next week. But this show, this show right here goes right along with with the, with all of that. This is amazing, man. I, I think that this is very well what rituals, a lot of these rituals, we'll never understand them 100 percent. If if I if. You know, because we're not in that we're not the ones doing the rituals. They're not. They're not telling. They're not letting me and David do these rituals. Not only are not letting us, we don't want to do them. And so these rituals are um, very secretive. I mean, stuff that's been passed down. I mean, for thousands of years, apparently, uh, thousands of years, and really only the elite of the elite want to are going to live. Or like they're going to try to live. They don't want us to live. If you really think about it, David, they want to sell us this idea of upgrading and all of these different things. But ultimately what they're probably going to do to us is actually get rid of all of our humanity. So when yeah. Jesus comes back, there's no one left to save and they will obtain immortality through their rituals. And I, I, I tell you, man, like, you know, the more I see the divide between the people at the top and the people at the bottom, the more I realize there's something we don't know. They got something going on. I really believe that whether or not we're talking about, this kind of ritual or the fact that these are true life entities that are just keep reappearing all throughout history and hit in Hollywood and in history. Uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure yet, but I'll tell you, I think it's a little mixture of both probably. I think you're exactly right. Yeah. And I think that, um, the grays are a last day's manifestation. I think it's a high tech way. They're just up in their game of we see in scripture, they were out to steal souls all the way back thousands of years before Christ. And this is kind of, I think, a, a little upgrade, last day's upgrade on the fallen ones, a little more sophisticated, maybe. Um, another statement here by Mr. Kerner, he says, so we come back to the question, why these artificially intelligent robotical entities, the greys, with technology far in advance of ours are so interested in us? What do we have that they want? What can we give them that their technology cannot? And uh, one of the obvious answers could be a soul. And why, why do all of these pagan 
religions that are based on the worship of the Nephilim want blood offered. Why always the sacrifice of blood? They don't have any. You know, Jesus in his resurrected state said a spirit does not have flesh and bone as you see me have. He had a spirit body of flesh and bone, but not blood because our Savior shed his blood upon the cross for us. But he had a real tangible flesh and bone body. That is the body that exists in the second and third heaven. And the reason why they want blood, they don't have any. The blood is the life. The life's in the blood. The blood is what enables us to have a body, soul, and spirit to function here in the first heaven. They don't have blood. They don't have a soul. And this is could very well uh, be what they're after. And one more thing here from Mr. Kerner. He says, and in his first book, uh, Gray Aliens and the Harvesting of Souls, uh, he said the harvesting of souls has been the main premise of the devil of folklore. Simply replace the word devil with the grays and all their alien robotical ilk, be they blue, green, yellow, orange, or red. So the demons and goblins of the past could have been the grays of today that were at one time believed to be metaphysical creations because those who witnessed them had no references against which to describe the techno technological features they saw. <laughs> and like John said, I think we've got both. Uh, we've, got, uh, we've got actual entities appearing, and I think we have to really consider that they are creating entities that are robotical, uh, that very much are doing their bidding. So I, I think this is a, a very good reality of what we've got going on. Now in John 10.10, 10, we know what the Bible says, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And when we think about stealing, yeah, uh, it's the soul he wants to steal. The gospel is there to save men's souls, and the devil is out to destroy them. And he wants to do more than just make people go bad. There have been the serious people on the dark side for thousands of years. They want to rip the soul out of the body, destroy it, capture it. And this is a um, the movie poster for... The Serpent and the Rainbow, which was a, a movie and also a book, and it's very, very fascinating. It talks about a Harvard professor, by the and it's based on very much a true story of a Harvard professor by the name of Wade Davis that was financed by Big Pharma to go to Haiti to get the zombie powder. There were people in Haiti that uh, some of them had been dead for 10 years, and they would see him. Uh, this one man they saw walking in a graveyard that had been dead for 10 years. They would turn up in insane asylums and in nursing homes and sometimes living like homeless derelicts on the street. And there was so much of this happened that uh, this Harvard professor financed by Big Pharma went down to research the zombie powder of, of, the, of the voodoo. And in, this, in, in the book, and at the end of this movie, it got real Hollywood. And actually, it's a pretty good movie. It's very close to the fact. And there at the end, there was an altar. When they final, finally cornered the bad guy, he had an altar with all kinds of jars that had souls in it. And when they came in there, and then they finally, I can't remember if they burned it or what, but all the souls, it was kind of like an Indiana Jones moment. We see all the souls going up out of the jars. Well, the, uh, the idea and the belief that in voodoo, that you can take the soul and capture it in a jar. This is a very specific voodoo ritual to this day. And to do that, they have used uh, what they call the zombie powder, which literally, um, uh, it's zombie powder. And I want to read just a little bit um, from The Serpent and the Rainbow, just a couple things on 188. And... Uh, he said, uh, I had come into direct contact with a number of secret societies, and in certain instances, it had been their leaders who controlled the powder. Max Bevois 
had gone so far as to suggest that the answer to the mystery lay within the councils of secret societies. I knew from my own research that in at least some instances zombie powder was controlled by the secret societies and a knowledge of poisons and their complex pharmacological properties could be traced in a direct lineage from the contemporary societies to the maroon bands and beyond to the secret societies of Africa. Now, there is, and of course we know that uh, sorcery in the book of Revelation is translating the word pharmakia. For a long time, uh, drugs have been connected with magical rituals, and there's a very, uh, you might say, low-level entry level of this, that are very obvious, the effect drugs can have on people, but there is also a very high level of sophistication where literally they can make a person look stone dead and bring them back to life after several days. And this is literally what we're talking about with this zombie powder. That was the possession of secret societies that was closely guarded uh, for thousands of years in these secret societies. There are such things that exist. This was a reality, and this is exactly uh, what Mr. Davis was down there looking into, and he claims to have actually found it. Yeah, and you know, I've heard of this before. I actually watched a video about a guy in Haiti that this this actually happened to three days, three nights. He was dead, and they he rose up out of the dead in that time and i believe that they do this they they figured out a way to do this obviously all, like you said pharmacia is magic they mix it's just like the old witches they got the little thing they mix the potion boom give it to you something happens to you right then like david said there's a high le high level of sophistication especially now with all the tools we have to discover all the different stuff that they're using but man if you really think about what that means they're trying to pretend like they can be jesus they're trying to pretend yeah. like they can die and then raise again yeah. after three days they believe they they truly believe that what they're doing is following jesus after his footsteps and it, you know elevating their spirit to the next level like jesus did jesus is, was transfigured and he became new body new you know he had a had his old body but a new body a new transfigured body and they want to manipulate that to say look jesus isn't really the messiah you can do this too. In fact, we're going to do it to you. And then I think that's, you know, where this, a lot of this stuff comes from because nobody in their right mind can believe just because you take drugs, you're going to automatically be transfigured. But obviously, obviously they're not in the right mind because I know I wouldn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Now, this is a book called Understanding Haitian Voodoo by Mr. Emmanuel Felix Jr. And this is written, he's a, he's a Christian man, and he's also a Haitian, and he really um, knows what he's talking about. But I'll read just a couple things from this book uh, by Mr. Felix. And on page 47, he said, Paul Morale defines a zombie as an individual whose soul was taken away by a sorcerer and who is now forced to be a slave. A zombie, someone whose soul has been stolen. Has anybody noticed any zombie stuff going on? <laughs> you know, any zombie movies, any zombie TV series, zombie apocalypse, zombie, 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 zombie. You know, uh, and literally, uh, a zombie is someone whose soul has been taken away. And then he asked the question, can the soul of a person be taken away and he quotes here um a uh, a source and he talks about what they believe and he says a well-organized mangerloa which means offering food to the spirits can guarantee success in the areas of economics politics and even in matters of love one can steal the soul of another and keep it in a bottle this is believed and practiced in Haitian voodoo. This was believed and practiced all the way back into Old Testament times. This has been a specific art of the dark side. And we, we know we can look and we can see and document why uh, that this has indeed gone on. But why? You know, why? And could it be 
that there are entities. And of course, there's the diabolical, obvious reason of people wanting to control other people to uh, be their zombie slaves and all of that. But there could be a deeper reason that there are entities out there that desire the souls of human beings, mm -hmm. the soul snatchers, the soul thieves, these entities that come to literally uh, want to draw the the soul out of a person the same spirit that's coming to people in the night with sleep paralysis the old hag syndrome and all of these things the soul snatchers and the soul thieves michael i got a question for you david in your mind what do you picture them doing once they allow the soul to leave the body do you picture them cutting the cord or letting that person go off and die and then then taking the body based on that and, and that do you think the person dies once their soul leaves the body and they cut that cord is that what you're saying here yeah and okay. i and we're going to get that specific we're going to show where they talk about cutting the cord all right it Fantastic. gets that specific yeah yeah they, they it, it's nothing less than that uh the absolute ripping of the soul out which and we're going to read the scripture and we're going to see what they say about it. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. They were talking about the removal of the human soul from the body. That's yeah. what we're talking about here. Very, very cool. Yeah. Now, here's a fellow, and John did a really good midnight ride um, on uh, the music industry, and uh, he can sure speak to this very well. And it was stunning um, in yeah. this midnight ride, uh, some of the things John brought forth. Yeah. Man, I can if you want me to speak to it, I definitely will. Oh yeah. So yeah, you know, just, there's this there's yeah. this documentary that was done. I believe I want to say it was in the 80s or 90s, called "Sold." They sold their soul to rock and roll. Now it's under copyright, and you can't just play it on YouTube. Or I would I, I've tried to do that before actually, and they didn't want it to play it on YouTube for some reason or other. You can put it up, and they'll take it down within a week. But fantastic documentary that documented people like Robert Johnson that you're looking at right here in this picture documenting him selling his soul telling people he sold his soul the story here was he was he'd be playing in clubs he'd be a young man playing in clubs and people would beg him to stop playing because he sucks so bad he was just a horrible player the noise of the guitar would just annoy people he wanted to play bad though well he claims he went and he went to a crossroads and at that crossroads he met the devil and the devil gave he sold his soul to the devil the devil gave him powers the people that knew him said when he came back the sounds that he made out of that guitar were almost supernatural. They could not believe the progress that he had made after coming back from the crossroads. Elvis Presley has a similar story. You have uh, The Devil Went Down to Georgia, which talks about the devil, the fiddle player. Um, there, Almost every musician, this, lately there's been a lot of musicians coming out saying that they've sold their soul. Some even regretting saying that they regret that they've sold their soul. And uh, even some people even bringing out more detail. Things are starting to come more and more and more to light yeah. about this ritual. Yeah. And I think you're right, David. I think this has everything to do with what we're talking about tonight. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm going to, we're going to get into some very um, real frightening possibilities that there are groups of individuals that will approach people like this to sell their soul. Yeah. And what was the young girl in Nashville used to be a Christian singer? Hey, uh, not Amy Grant, but um, Katy Perry. Katy Perry. Yeah. I mean, and they just come out and say it. There are many of these. And there are people that will approach uh, aspiring musicians and actresses with the chance to make a soul for the devil. And also we're going to show you the chilling reality that there are people that will approach people in the hours near their death or that have a terminal illness or whatever, and they will try to persuade them to relinquish their soul for another entity to inhabit. This is actually, uh, it's actually going on. It's an actual fact. We're going to be talking into that. And we're going to, we're going to talk a little bit here about packs with the devil. Mm. And, uh, this is just like Robert Johnson. Uh, he sold his soul to the devil, made a pact with the devil for supernatural abilities. And this is a little bit of verbiage here, and we've, we've not got it all on there. It's literally a blood-curdling oath to Lucifer. And as you could see here, and it's literally a pact to sell your soul to Lucifer. And you can see here it says, for the length of my natural life 
and I'm not even going to read it. But it says here, and there's a place there, invocant signs packed with his own blood. Mm -hmm. Now, where does this come from? This is from this book right here, The Secret Teachings of All Ages by Manly P. Hall, Freemasonry's greatest philosopher. Maybe we need to have a board meeting and vote whether Freemasonry is good or not. Maybe we need to have a meeting and discuss it. I tell you what, the apostate church has lost its mind and they have lost its spine. They are mad. They are mad and drunken with the, with the wine of the harlot. They don't know right from wrong. They have no spine, mm -hmm. absolutely no spine. Lost their mind and their spine. Yeah. Now, I want to speak now to young kids, um, old kids, everybody. Uh, so many young teenagers get involved with these satanic groups and make packs with the devil and sell their soul to the devil. This is happening at a breakneck speed. I mean, there's just so much of this, it's frightening. And when a person does this, um, needless to say, this can torment you all your life. It can make you think you're lost. But I want to say tonight that we're going to read from God's holy law about rash vows how that a person, they, you can have forgiveness and redemption from a rash vow. Uh, it's so easy to overspeak and um, be all about your little self. But let's just read the Word of God. It says, or if a soul swear, pronouncing with his lips to do evil or to do good, whatsoever it be that a man shall pronounce with an oath, and it shall be hid from him. When he knoweth of it, then he shall be guilty in one of these. In other words, when... You, you don't really realize, uh, you know, the uh, what's, what's really going to be the end road of this thing. And it says, And it shall be when he shall be guilty in one of these things, that he shall confess that he hath sinned in that thing, and he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord for his sin, which he hath sinned, a female from the flock, a lamb or a kid of the goats for a sin offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning his sin. And for all of you, that have made, and just like the vows of Freemasonry, every oath in Freemasonry has a horrific, blood curdling, rash vow. There is forgiveness and freedom in Christ right now. If you have done this and you have sold your soul to the devil, I know many people that have repented and broke that pact, and they have found repentance and life in Jesus Christ. So in the name of Jesus, repent and renounce that, that vow where you sold your soul to Satan. He can't have it. In Jesus' name, repent and turn to Jesus and he is powerful to save. Even under the law, with the, the Levitical sacrifices, there was freedom and forgiveness for rash vow. How much more when our King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus Christ, shed his blood for us, how much more is there deliverance and freedom from that rash vow right now? In Jesus' name, don't let Satan take your soul, but repent, renounce that rash vow, and come to Jesus. Amen. You know, in Proverbs, where you were talking about before, I, me and, um, well, over on the nystv.org, I'm doing a Proverbs series, and we went through that chapter just recently, and you see the comparison between the woman of wisdom and then the harlot, the one that's drawing people in, and, and it talks about the ways of foolishness, basically the ways of foolishness being associated with that harlot who draws men to death, and what causes the naivety you talked about in this verse and causes the... A, I guess the chance for someone to make this pact and be able to do this is naivety, is foolishness, is going the way of foolishness versus going the way of wisdom. And as we know in the scriptures that going the way of wisdom is associated with learning the ways of God, knowing, knowing the ways that are true, knowing the ways that are holy, contemplating those things and walking in those ways. And unless we even do that, you, you know, we can, we can, um, all day long, there's a lot of Christians who are not really Christians that are, you know, they maybe they said the prayer, they did whatever, they walk right into this because there's no wisdom found among them. Wisdom is a mark, I believe, a mark of those who truly seek after God's knowledge. And even Christians yeah. that don't seek after God's knowledge, that choose to remain naive, I believe that they, they are in danger of this very thing if they're not careful. They absolutely are. 
Yeah. Um, you know, and could could the reality be <laughs> just like the old movie Invasion of the Body Snatchers? Well, we'll take over the mayor. Uh, then we'll take over the chief of police, yeah. you know, and could it be that they're literally taking over our world? You know, could yeah. that really be a real scenario? Yeah, um, it really could. This is a book called Strangers Among Us. This was written in 1979 by Ruth Montgomery, a lady that uh, spent a lot of time in Vincennes, Indiana, not very far from us. Very one of the real new age pioneers, uh, new age authors. Uh, back in the 70s, and she wrote, this is book of 79, and she wrote other books on this earlier than that, and she talked about the walk-ins, what she called the walk-ins, and uh, and on the, I'll just read from the back cover of this book, it says, you may know a walk-in, they are high-minded entities permitted to take over the bodies of human beings who wish to depart this life. Their mission is to lead us into an astonishing new age. They are walk-ins, and there are tens of thousands of them on this planet. In her most revealing book yet, Ruth Montgomery, America's Greatest Authority on Psychic Phenomenon, provides an intimate look at the rapidly approaching era heralded by these strangers among us. And literally, that's what Miss... Um, Mrs. Montgomery claimed in 1979 that there were hundreds of thousands of people in prominent positions in society that were no longer human, that their soul had left their body and they had been taken over by these other entities that long for soul. Mm. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Yeah. Now, I'll read, and we're going to have a little more from this uh, in, in just a moment. Now, let's read. This scripture, this is what John alluded to the other, uh, just a few moments ago. In Ecclesiastes 12, 6, and 7, it says, Or ever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. And it talks about the silver cord being loosed. And this is talking about what happens when we die. You know, when you die, your body goes to dust and your spirit goes back to God. And the Bible talks about a silver cord that literally anchors the human soul to the body. We're a body, we're a soul and a spirit. That's the way God created us. And the body is protection for our soul and spirit because they are... Uh, they have substance, but they're, uh, I don't know how to describe them, uh, just kind of a loose, transparent kind of an existence. Now, I want to read from page 125 on this book by Ruth Montgomery, and it says this. It says, uh, when a baby is born, his umbilical cord must be cut, the guides explained. Likewise, when the physical body dies, the so-called silver cord is severed because the silver cord belongs to the departing soul or walk out. It must be snapped before a walk-in enters. Hmm. This, you know, the question you ask right there, it is. Yeah, yeah. we got to we got to have that soul out. We got to have the cord snapped. And literally, this gets filed this under uh, creepy, creepy, and more creepy. But on uh, page 27, Miss Montgomery writes this. Uh, Those who would contemplate suicide might better give thought to permitting those superior souls to use their bodies and let them take over during sleep or sickness, withdrawing into spirit to rest, for a time and reassess their own souls. Why destroy a usable body when it will serve a laudable purpose for another? Why indeed? And, you know, of course, what they don't tell you is, you know, you're not going to leave to come back later. You're going to hell. You're damning yourself for all eternity. And literally in her writing, she talks about groups of people that are walk-ins. They'll approach people. Mm. You know, they'll approach people and they'll say, you know, you could imagine the creepy scenario going to someone uh, that is suicidal or terminal illness or whatever and say, you know, hey, uh, how about this? You know, how about uh, you give your body 
to this super entity. And I tell you what, they're getting takers on it. Just like the same way there are people that are approaching uh, aspiring actresses and musicians with this pact with the devil. Does it work? Well, uh, according to many, many, many people, uh, it has worked from them. And there are more and more people, like John said, in the music industry, they're just absolutely coming out and saying, absolutely, this is what we did and why I'm here. There's a verse, David, in Psalm chapter 2, that, and, I, and I, I want your take on this because when reading the other scripture we read in Ezekiel 13, it just reminded me of this verse because there are similar wordage in this verse. Uh, Psalm chapter 2, verse 3, or let's start in verse 2. It says, The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, listen here, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Um, and I've struggled with this verse many times thinking, what in the world does this mean? It could mean a lot of things, uh, but in your opinion, is this tied in in any way? Is it possible? Uh, it, it possibly could be. And here it's talking about the bands and the restrictions that the godly would have that uh, are opposing Christ. And there are bans and restrictions as, in other words, they're saying we want to smash anything that would hold us back from achieving our agenda. And in the same way, the scripture speaks of the bans of the ungodly, that they're wanting to put on the righteous. And bans speak of domination and, and bondage is what it speaks of, just like in the text in Ezekiel 13, you could, when you, when you read that, it's just like they're, they're on the bed and like we're tied down with something perhaps, yeah. you know, that, uh, brings, uh, ugly scenarios to our mind also. But, uh, I think it very much could. And it talks about this spiritual battle between the Lord most high and the fallen powers. And it's, uh, it's a battle that, uh, you're either on one side or on the other. There's no middle ground. Right on, and I believe that too. The reason I was wondering too is because you know you think about it. There's um, maritime law and all of the different things that associate with us being born. You know, when you when you really look at the wordage of being at birth, birth. You know, when it talks about a ship coming into harbor, give it a wide berth. It needs a wide berth in order to, to obtain. Then you have a certificate. You have a social security card. Um, I've heard it explained b before by supposedly a former elite and a high level 33rd degree Freemason that this pact that's made at birth is believed by the elites to give them the authority over your soul in order for them to use you to power themselves. And I have no idea if that's 100% true. It makes a lot of sense because they, we do have to sign these things that yeah. they give us. They, they basically, we are owned as soon as we're born, as soon as the birth certificate hits the field, we yeah. are owned and we have a number on the stock market, social security yeah. number, and all of that. Yeah, I think that is definitely true. And even though these things might seem innocuous and harmless of themselves, those are the things that tie everyone in America to that system. Yeah. And certainly the ultimate goal of the dark side is for total enslavement of humanity, total control, um, creating that ungodly system where anything that would speak against them or raise a voice for the king of kings be put forth. So I think there's a lot to that, John. I just, yeah. I would yeah. incline to say I believe that. Yeah. It's, it's scary, you know, when you really think about what we've born been born into you know it talks yeah we hear this talk about the matrix and all that stuff and, and even the bible it talks about us entering through the matrix which is basically another word for the womb we're entering into this and you talked about the umbilical cord being cut once entering into this matrix and then we have this other kind of umbilical cord that reaches the heavens it's really interesting man there's so much in that and it's just amazing to see it unpacked i'll let you go on though i know you got some more to talk about and uh really the most interesting stuff coming up so stay tuned well let's let's have another thought here let's look at john chapter 6 verse 70 jesus answered them have not i chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil mm -hmm. now <laughs> you know and 
uh, someone wrote a letter to Charles Spurgeon one time and asked them about a verse of scripture, what it meant. And Brother Spurgeon wrote back, uh, that scripture means just what it says. Thank you, Charles Spurgeon. <laughs> Could it be that this means just what it says? It doesn't say, uh, you know, Jesus answered them, have not I chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil? Didn't say you act like the devil, you're behaving like a devil, but it says is a devil. Could it be that Judas had so apostatized? We know from Scripture there are two places where Satan entered into Judas. We can see it two times in Scripture. But could it be that the son of perdition went so far that literally his soul left his body and he was totally taken over? I think that is indeed the case. I really do. And we're, we're going to look at a scripture here in John chapter 17 and verse 12. And that word destruction, uh, uh, which is a, the same base of the root word apollyon, interesting enough, uh, but says, while, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in my name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And perdition means destruction. And could it be, and, and I, I think, you know, if you just believe what it says, you have to really consider the fact that Judas wasn't Judas anymore. He was a devil. There was what the body that was once Judas was now inhabited by a, a fallen entity uh, and, and one of the big ones on the pecking order. Now let's look at Second Thessalonians 2 and 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Now here we see the prophecy of the coming Antichrist that is also uh, called the son of perdition. And I went ahead and got, a, I've already read, read page 27 out of that, so we'll just go to the next slide, John. Okay. I read, I got so excited, I read the quote <laughs> right. I was going to read right. there anyway. So anyway, um, let, let's think about this now. Uh, Judas was called the son of perdition, and uh, it says, you are a devil. Well, the coming false prophet is also called the son of perdition, just like Judas, the only other entity in Scripture called the son of perdition. Now, in Hebrews 10 and 5, wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. This is speaking of Jesus. Jesus was born because of the virgin birth, the Holy Spirit overpowering uh, Mary and allowing him to be born fully God, fully man. A body was prepared by the Holy Spirit moving upon Mary to bring about the virgin birth, that he would be born without the stain of sin. Now, everything to understand what the devil does, everything that Satan does is to imitate what God has done. Now, I believe that just like a body was prepared for Christ, that Satan is at work preparing a body for the final beast, the final son of perdition. Look what it says in Revelation 17:11. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And I believe this literally speaks, Revelation chapter 9, it talks about uh, Abaddon and Apollyon that is in the abyss, and they'll be released, and literally it's going to go into perdition, this final false prophet. And I believe there's, there's two in the book of Revelation. There's the beast and the false prophet. I believe both of these are going to be absolutely taken over. They're going to be uh, not just mean, not just devil-possessed. Their souls are be gone. They're going to be gone, and they're going to be absolutely controlled by other entities that are using their bodies. Mm. You know, when we look, when you think about that too, in a in a wide variety con or just a wide context of the people we deal with in everyday life, um, the people we encounter, you know, knowing that they're, you know, I did a show a few weeks ago called um, the, the Evidence of Thirty Three Million Angels, and the Bible says there's ten thousands times ten thousand, and that's 
right there is 100 million and then one third of that's 33 million so that's where i came up with a number and one third equals 33.33333 continuing yeah uh, so you're you're talking this kind of angels then you're talking on top of that you're talking this stuff going on so the chances of an encounter with an entity of this magnitude is higher than one might think in my opinion and i believe that i've had encounters with in people entities uh all of these different things throughout my life you know looking back thinking about people i've encountered i believe i've encountered people and entities like this and i and i'm sure that david has i'm sure we all have at some point or another and being understanding that some people are not just regular people some people will out be out you know, very subtle very smart, very wise, and they are they are the kind of people you have to watch out for, the people that pretend to be your friends, the people that come in close oh, yeah. to you and are able to, oh, yeah. you know, weasel their way in are uh, sometimes these entities. And we have to be very careful, especially those of us who are public about our faith and those of us who are proclaiming the Word of God and trying to live the right way, believe that there are enough of these entities for one to be assigned to you. Believe that. I believe that. What do you think, David? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And if you haven't watched the um, the Midnight Ride that John referred to, uh, don't get left out. I think about 300,000 people have watched it so far. <laughs> yeah. And last Friday night, uh, I took a play off of that, and my Friday night message on FOJC Radio was entitled, uh, The 33 Million Fallen Angels Defeated. So I... I uh, did a play on John's title there for my message um, last Friday night on FOJC. <laughs> but yeah, that's awesome, man. I mean, th it's it's amazing when you really think about that that magnitude. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah we need to think about. Um, there's a bunch of them, and we need to also think that well, there's a third fallen. That means two thirds aren't. So we don't need to get all forlorn, but we th we need to be aware of the spiritual world. Mm -hmm. Because everything that transpires in the physical world is a result and a product of what goes on in the spiritual world. And understanding our role in spiritual warfare, that we can enter in and make a difference by praying, that we can make a difference of what goes on down here. And certainly, uh, we have the spiritual victory over these dark entities that want to come in to destroy our lives and our ministries and our families. Yeah, we've seen that firsthand. There's no doubt about that, David. I, I know I know that's the case for sure. And um, with that being said, guys, thank you, David. Thank you so much for bringing this message. Help us be aware of what is actually going on in this world that we believe is going on in this world. Because, you know, when, unless you know your enemy, know what your enemy is capable of, it's really hard to defend yourself or to even uh, mount an attack against something like this. So um, if you enjoyed this content, please subscribe. We do this every single week and we enjoy putting this stuff out. And we really, um, you know, we make it our mission to do the best job that we can possibly do. And if you agree with that and you think that we do a decent job, please hit the subscribe button. And we do this thing we call the Pounders Pound. Pounders is my last name. And I don't know, it just it stuck somehow. And it, it, that's Pounders what we call is it. your name and pounding is it's your game. Pounding's my game. So we're going to do this on the count of three. David's going to help us count it down. We're going to do this. Here we go, guys. Ready? One, two, two three. three. Boom. Boom. Boom shakalaka. We got this. And thank you guys so much for hitting the like button. Uh, David, if you got any final words, give them to us and end us out, man. Well, as always, we just have such thankfulness to all of you that watch the Midnight Ride and support us with your prayers. And we just love you. We couldn't do what you do without you. And like I say, share this video out, like John said, and hit the like button. Uh, and it's all about Jesus. It's about getting the gospel of Jesus Christ out to people, letting people know that Jesus is real. He is the virgin-born Son of God that died upon the cross for us, that we can be set free from all of the packs and the schemes of the devil. Turn to Jesus, the real Jesus, before it's everlastingly too late. And with that, we just want to say, until next 10, 10, till 10 p.m. Central next Saturday night. High five and good night, everybody, from the Midnight Ride. Good night, everybody. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast. Rise up, rise up, rise up, rise up.